Welcome back to this week's Seeker Strength paper review. Today's paper delves into the topic of active recovery. Is active recovery a legitimate technique or is it just a load of nonsense? So today's paper is coming at us from uh, Norway and Sweden. So it was a uh, joint effort. It is titled Neuromuscular Fatigue and Recovery in Elite Female Soccer Effects of active recovery so essentially we are seeing the researchers wanted to see basically the effects of active recovery and what kind of results do they get and do they improve performance or do they improve recovery and ability to perform the following days so what we had was we had two soccer teams uh, 22 elite female soccer players from sweden and norway they played two friendly matches 90 minutes in length they were separated by 72 hours they then separated the players into two different groups so we had a passive recovery group and an active recovery group so The active recovery group had a combination of aerobic exercise and resistance training exercise as their active recovery. So for their active recovery aerobic exercise, they had they performed stationary cycling at 60 percent of their peak heart rate and approximately 45 percent of their VO2 max, which was measured two days prior on a treadmill uh, to the matches and the beginning of testing. So for their resistance training recovery, they had approximately 30 minutes low intensity resistance training a uh, series of uh, machine movements at about 50 percent of their 1rm and this was done at 22 hours and 46 hours alongside the aerobic training so two sessions of this in between the matches so then a series of neuromuscular and biochemical measurements were taken the neuromuscular measurements were 20 minute sprint uh, counter movement jump maximal isokinetic leg extension and flexion and then perceived muscle soreness was recorded on a scale that they were using this then was also recorded at post 5, 21, 27, 45, 51 and 69 hours post matches and then once following the post second match. Um, then for the biochemical measurements, they were taken three hours before the first match and then 21, 45, 69 hours post match. And what was recorded was creatine kinase, urea and uric acid. Finally, the last couple of measurements taken more a series of in-depth measurements on the player's activity on field during the game so basically um a way of quantifying their actual activity on the field so they had heart rate uh, was monitored they had total distance run and the speed they were running on pitch so quite a comprehensive series of data was collected on all of these athletes post during and uh, biochemically neuromuscularly so a whole host of ranges recorded so a lot of data was collected and was very very useful So Fitz is just going to give a little rundown of the interpretation and results of this uh, testing. So yeah, in terms of the results and what we need to look for, the first thing we need to look at is, were they fatigued following the game? Did they recover effectively in between the two games? And then was there a difference uh, in their performance of both games, right? So in terms of difference in performance between the two games, we get average heart rates above 160 BPM in both So they're still reaching high heart rates or reaching that bracket of high heart rate. They actually ran an... So important running numbers here are like high intensity running. So the amount of distance covered above a certain speed is what you'd usually look at. Uh, In this, they actually did more high intensity running in the second game than they did in the first. This is on average. Uh, So it looks like there were good recovery values in between the two games, right? The next thing we look at then is we make sure the groups are normalized. So we make sure that there aren't any huge differences in directly following the first game. We need to make sure people aren't like they don't have huge differences in perceived muscular soreness. Make sure they don't have huge differences across the kind of the main uh, biomechanical uh, measures. So like if you just if it happened to be that the defenders of one team were working a hell of a lot harder, you might have some differences. So those differences were normalized. Uh, and those groups were kind of selected as to that. So there's no differences there. The average heart rate in the second match was actually higher. So it shows that players are working harder in the second game, so they have achieved that level of recovery they were looking for. So now it comes down to the kind of meat and gravy of the study, what we're looking for. Were the active recovery group better than the passive recovery group or vice versa? What we see is we see no difference. So we see across our kind of four biomechanical factors, we see no difference between the two groups in terms of their counter-movement jump, 
their max sprint. We see no difference in their uh, ability to produce torque at the knee with flexion or extension. So it looks from this like there isn't any effect coming from the active recovery versus passive recovery. And it's important to note as well that, that they were fatigued. You know, we see uh, 3% decreases in sprint performance. We see up to 10% decreases in counter movement jump performances. We see a kind of up around 10% in that knee torque test. So it's important to note that these players were all fatigued. It wasn't that any groups had any differences in them. And then active versus passive didn't really seem to have any effect. So if you're a coach or an athlete now at this point, um, you need to start looking for what's important in this paper, right? And what's important in this paper and what I think we can really glean from this is, is they look at the decay profiles of the fatigue. So they look at how long it takes people to recover in terms of getting back to 100% of sprint performance terms of getting back to 100% of counter movement jump performance uh so there's huge differences here right and this is this is very very important for us as athletes as coaches as whatever so if i compare sprint performance within three hours i get back to my max sprint speeds right within 51 hours i get back to max torque at the knee inflection and extension so these kind of differences are huge like they're significant statistically but they're also important for us to be thinking about and for us to be cognizant of our biochemical factors then so the results for urea uric acid uh, and we can actually put perceived muscular soreness in with that all of those are significantly higher directly following the first game and then we have no differences in effect uh, in terms of active versus passive recoveries so the perceived muscular soreness is an interesting one because in in most of the literature we've looked at so far, in most of the papers, the review papers, the meta-analyses we've done are looked at, uh, perceived muscular soreness is something that regularly does get decreased with active recovery, um, but it doesn't happen here, right? What happens here is we get a mirroring of the decay profile with the urea and the uric acid, uh, so it seems as though as those compounds are leaving or as those compounds are becoming less concentrated within the muscle and within the blood, we get perceived muscular soreness decreasing. So first of all, I think we just, uh, the implications of the study, I think are quite interesting. Uh, it's not something that's quite surprising, I suppose to me, and fits kind of a belief we've had for a while, but obviously, you know, it's important to back up your beliefs, especially in terms of this with actual rigorous interventional studies, you know, data, you know, it's important to, logically and be critical with things and think about them out and have critical thinking but important then you know to be open to different changes in your belief but this study we we're very very happy with this you know it was very well designed there was very very comprehensive so some of the good factors about this which i'm very happy with, we had elite level athletes so fully trained athletes people who train a lot you know their experience of training so they would have um gone over that initial curve of adaptions you know especially in terms of um you know their neuromuscular fatigue so they would have some adaption to that so they'd be resilient to some forms of that and then their you know levels of biochemical results you know so like they're creating kinase or whatever wouldn't be massively extreme which we would see in beginners for example probably so if they were to do this much intense exercise initially in untrained individuals you know we would see probably very unrepresentative values of people watching this for example who would be reasonably well trained at this stage so you, you've gone through your initial training curve very likely so those results would be kind of skewed. So that's great when we get a good level athletes. Um, so they recorded a whole host of data, which was another very, very useful thing. So for example, like they're just the amount of work they were doing on pitch. So the measures then they took were quite useful. So they were fairly standard, counter movement jump, isometric strength is very, very common among these kind of studies, you know, flexion. Their biochemical analysis was fairly useful, for example. So like creating kinase is very often associated with muscle damage. So creating kinase exists in these cells for uh, changing uh, creatine to with the use of AD, ATP to ADB and phosphocreatine. So very often when muscle damage is done, uh, creatine kinase is released and is used as a measure of, um, you know, a, a muscle damage essentially is what it's used as or, or kind of a crude way of looking at that. So one of the significant things I think about this is in the results for before match. So there was between, the, so the active recovery group had an increased levels of, um, of creating kinase compared to the passive group which would make perfect sense you know for example the passive group weren't doing exercise so the creating kinase in theory shouldn't have increased unless they'd underline conditions for example whereas then our 
active recovery group, their creatine kinase was elevated compared to the passive group. And that would make perfect sense. They were doing some exercise, so more exercise would release more creatine kinase, uh, even to smaller levels, you know. So like exercise is exercise, essentially, for anyone watching this. So if you're not, you may not be an elite level soccer player, but the thought that active recovery might have some positive effects in terms of, you know, metabolic or biochemical or neuromuscular conditions is probably unfounded it looks to be like from the results of this there are essentially no changes between the groups so low the low intensity exercise is just essentially low intensity exercise it's an exercise that you're able to recover from so it's it's vastly below your level of recovery so your level of recovery is up here the low intensity exercise you do for your active recovery is down here you don't meet that threshold and you're very well able to recover from that but however you're still adding a little bit of fatigue so eventually fatigue adds up across you know cns fatigue and like muscular damage so long story short exercise is more exercise more exercise you have more damage you have more fatigue in your system no matter how you know low intensity is or how little of it you do at a certain stage you're still putting stress on your system and uh, regardless of your beliefs of what you're doing or your intentions behind that ultimately physically neuromuscularly and biochemically you're putting stress in your system um and that is kind of undisputable and from logical thinking you would imagine that and it's interesting to see it from here it very much looks like that passive recovery does not increase your recovery so it doesn't increase your ability to recover between bouts of exercise um but neither does it seem to low intensity exercise for example impact your performance it essentially looks very similar to breaking even for example now i'd say we would kind of speculate over a long run so if you're doing this over six months if you did it, we know we kind of have like this kind of creeping fatigue and total volume adds up in the end so if you were to do this over six months with a lot of low intensity exercise you know in resistance training uh stationary bike if you were to add all this up this volume up like we would do for example in weightlifting training where we would add tonnage if you had all this total work up at the end you would very much much likely end up with a greater state of fatigue i would imagine now obviously we don't have any guaranteed evidence of that from this as this was on two or three days but we know from you know coaching people and we know from lar larger principles of coaching like volume adds up over time and without extended breaks you know you will eventually be more fatigued than you prior you will eventually catch up to your ability if you're doing a lot of training and then you're doing your active recovery you're adding extra volume in extra work in into the hole so your total tonnage of volume, your total volume of work, whatever units you're measuring it in, will eventually add up and eventually fatigue you more if you're not taking into account. So if you are taking into account and you use these sessions and you are smart with them and you know they're going to be done and you want to do them for particular reasons, which fits will get into a second, then you'll know that this fatigue will add up. But if you're doing these ad hoc, so if you're just doing them when you think you are very fatigued, so you do your maximal, you do a heavy four by ten back squat session the next day you think i'm going to go and do an active recovery exercise or you've done a lot of wads or you've done you know you replicated the games workouts and you've done four or five sessions you think the next day i'm going to do active recovery uh in reality you're not recovering any faster and likely after a very very intense bout of exercise for example the day before it's possible that you're just adding more fatigue and very very it looks like that you're not actually recovering any faster okay so to discuss these findings um there's a few things here that I think are really important. I touched during the, the results section on the importance of those decay profiles and how they might be useful for us as athletes. And I think we can probably delve into that a small bit more, right? So if I'm, Gurf talked about CrossFitters earlier, or if I'm a a rugby coach or a soccer coach, if I'm the soccer coach in this in this instance, I'll know that bringing my players into the gym to do some sort of resistance or some sort of power training on a Monday morning, once they've had a game on a Sunday or even on a, a Monday morning after a game on a Saturday evening, doing those kind of maximal outputs in terms of strength movements is going to be in some way counterproductive. So due to their fatigue, they're going to be uh, performing sub-maximally. So that's not something we ever want to get them doing. The interesting thing here, though, is that in terms of the very, very high output, so our, our maximal sprints, our counter-movement jumps, these things we consider with kind of very high neural loads, reaction times being really, really tested, we see that those come back incredibly quickly. So if I'm a, a coach and, or a, a trainer and we're looking at an athlete who's competed at the weekend, they might have a game the next weekend and we're looking at those recovery profiles, we realize that we can get an athlete back to those kind of sprinting sessions and those, those discrete areas of very, very high outputs 
in an incredibly short time period, those things can come back in a small bit quicker and um, because we understand we'll have recovered from them. Or at least if we're testing them, we'll understand that any decrease in performance is, is, isn't due to fatigue. The next thing I think we should talk about then is the, the perceived muscular soreness. So a lot of the time with the active recovery stuff, it's people feel great. I feel like I'm, I'm flushing out whatever it is. Um, and it's something that comes up over and over again. Perceived muscular soreness or DOMS seems to decrease with active recovery. In this paper, it didn't happen. Um, and what you're getting with DOMS and what you're getting with perceived muscular soreness a lot of the time is due to the metabolites being present in the muscle, due to those waste products still being there, uh, you have that perception of soreness. I think the kind of the fact that we can see the mirroring of the decay profiles when the urea and when the uric acid are uh, decreasing, it kind of backs this up even more. Um, it may just be that the active recovery profiles were slightly different in this study than they have been in previous ones, but it may be just due to the fact that these athletes weren't responding to it. I think, in general, the use of a perceived muscular sco soreness score isn't that applicable, especially when we have real biochemical data and when we have real biomechanical data, when we're getting proper outputs and consistent measuring of these using a perceived scale um very very like it adds very little uh to the efficacy of this study the last thing then i talk about is uh, or i think we should mention is the fact that training at these low intensities we say like oh doing the active recovery as Garf was talking about is like training at low intensity so the fact that training at these low intensities didn't give us a huge amount more fatigue like we we saw there's an increase in creatine kinase in the active recovery group pre game two uh but this mightn't like it wasn't statistically significant uh but it's important to note that this doesn't have a huge detrimental effect on athletes as well so if you have an athlete or if you have a team who need to come and practice the skill or practice the sport or do an area of their their routine where they need practice it's important to note that studies like this show us that you can go and do it it won't be beneficial for their recovery, but it also won't be detrimental for their recovery. So if you have a, a kicker who after a game needs to go and practice for set pieces for next week, or you have particular special teams players that need to go and practice their things, that won't be too detrimental to their recovery, assuming all those intensities are kept nice and low. So thanks very much for watching another one of these paper reviews. As always, put your opinions below. We love seeing people giving feedback in the comments. Uh, if you have papers or if you have areas like this, the area of looking at active recovery came from one of our one-to-ones last week because we always rag on active recovery. And he said, I think it'd be a great idea if you just went and got a paper and did it because you wanted more info on it. So if you're watching these now and think, geez, I'd love if Darren Gurf went and looked at X, Y, or Z, uh, pop that in the comments below. If you want more stuff like this, we have loads more videos on the channel. We also have Seek a Strength's Instagram page where there's loads of clips and Instagram TV videos. Uh, and for any training programs, any one-to-one -one coaching or consultation for coaching, uh, you can go to seekastrength.com and you'll find it all there. Thanks, guys.